video is brought to you by my patrons. If you'd like to support, head over to patreon.com slash Fish. And by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Welcome to Darlene's DIY channel. Today, we're actually gonna do something a little bit different and talk about two DIY style icons who recently made a big splash on the streaming platform Nebula. I mean, Netflix. Sorry, weird how that just kind of rolled out of my mouth. This is the show that got me through my scare. And if you all remember, that was when we all first learned about the outbreak and I was afraid that my gardener might have it because, you know, he's like working in the dirt all day. Ew. So I crawled in the shower and cried for a couple hours. I live streamed the whole thing over on my vlog channel. You should check it out if you haven't yet. It was sponsored by Sensational Spas. For all your pool and spa needs. <laughs> Motel Makeover follows the story of best friends and that's it. We're business partners, best friends, and we're building a motel empire. Sarah and April, owners of the quirky, kitschy June Motel in Prince Edward County, Canada. We take gross old motels and we bring them back to life. The Netflix series follows these two as they flip an old motel into their second location in the coastal beach town of Sauble Beach. April here comes from the marketing world, and let's just say, you can tell. We're gonna Junify this place. Junify is a word that we invented. That means taking a place that's not pretty and finding ways to make it really special. It's all about the high-low mix. Although they didn't have any real experience. We had zero experience in hospitality and zero professional experience in design and renovation. Each of these ladies is a self-made entrepreneur. Or, sorry. An entrepreneur, a girl boss, a motelier. In other words, they seem to be able to make mistakes left and right because they have a lot of money. So they can pay to fix any problem that pops up, even the problems that they themselves have caused. They're probably best known for their catchy and unique off-the-cuff quips. This is the dream, a motel pool. I have a lot of confidence in our ability to work hard and get it done. Particularly love the jumpsuit day. Makes me feel like we're all ready to work, Yeah. right? And overall down-to-earth relatability. I feel like it's a really special throwback, good old days moment to get a lobster roll. Yeah. We watch them struggle with their work-life balance. It's really tough to balance business and love. There will be years that we'll get to invest more into the relationships in our lives, but this is just not one of them. Last year I got married to Rod. He's so supportive, but he's very private. He doesn't even have Instagram. So weird. And the financial anxieties of two ridiculously rich people. Is $100,000 enough? It's all we have. I know. And it goes without saying, their personalities really ingratiate them with the locals. Any chance you guys have oat milk lattes? No, I don't think so, sorry. Almond milk lattes? Soy milk lattes? Can I do a green tea, please? Sure. Doesn't say a lot, but he has agreed to do the project. All right. What makes this show really hit home is that it's not just a six episode ad for the new June Motel. It's also a great how-to guide for anyone out there getting ready to become your own motelier. You know that me and Paul have been setting aside mounds of our YouTube IOUs to buy up a small farm from a struggling family, which we would probably bulldoze, who can't afford to make ends meet anymore. But this show made me think, why not use that money to buy a motel where that struggling family can come and pay us to get away from their troubles. These girls get it. Motels have typically been family-run operations. They sure were family-run, but they were bought up by people like April and Sarah, whose business goal was not to just own one single motel, but are in fact building a motel empire. Rooms went from $90 to $500 a night and we've been sold out ever since. Let's take a look at how these two moteliers with no design experience go about designing their new motel. 
I don't know why, but at first, I had high hopes for these queen bees. Maybe I'm biased in the kind of interior design I enjoy, as evidenced in my bedroom, which has been repeatedly described as clockwork orange-esque. But part of the fun of redecorating an entire motel, I would think, is to really put your artistic stamp on it. It's a design show. I don't feel like I'm asking much. There are no real rules when it comes to mixing colors. Okay, well, that's debatable. We like to play within the color palette until the balance is just right. And then it started. We're painting the front of the restaurant and the A-frame white. Painting everything white. Including the rock walls on the side. Number one thing is like brighten up the space. It's gonna look good white. Beautiful 70s wood paneling wall that I would legitimately kill to have in my house. I'm actually so happy that the wood paneling was here. Paint it white. It's character. Totally. Yeah. Brick deck, white. Let's cover this interlocking brick with a white wooden deck. The original exposed stone. This, like, favorite part of the motel right here. We're painting it white. No, we're not. I mean, sure, who doesn't want to live in the prison from THX 1138? And if it's not Chip Skylark white, they pick what I can only describe as cervical wall pink. We painted our kitchen pink. We love apricot beige. It's intense, but it's warm. It's intense, but it's warm. And what's really weird is how different their concept art is to the final product. It's like they'd start with at least a passable idea, but then slowly give up and talk themselves out of making any choice at all. <laughs> this is the best. I can't, I don't even have any words. Like in this bathroom concept art, they pick a fancy hexagonal tile. But in the reveal, it's the same square tiles from any locker room shower. It's a very cool bathroom, I really like it. They picked the square tiles because they're cheaper. How do I know they're cheaper? Because besides mislabeling everything as unique, vintage, and Scandinavian, the other thing that they constantly talk about is how little money they spend on the things going into the $500 a night rooms. Most of their Junify tips are just ways of creating barely passable furniture that would crumple under the weight of a rosé can. The motel makeover design aesthetic culminates in what the Shining Twins call moment. It's awesome. Yeah. That's such a good moment. I think that's a really cool photographed moment. But the plan is to create a bit of a moment. This is gonna be a photo moment. This is an iconic moment. That is a moment. And we've been looking for those moments. Moments are like slices of life that pop. Or in marketing turned motelier speak, repackaging the human experience as product for consumption. That's what? it, Instagram yeah. moment. Yeah. Our pink doors at our first motel are so iconic. And a big social media moment. I really want to lean into the moment of the ceiling. <laughs> That's so funny, I'm always leaning into the moments of my ceiling. That's what? it, Instagram yeah. moment. Yeah. What these women bring to the motel experience cannot be understated. I often think of motels as these Gross. Gross? Poor people hotels, but with some ingenious design and smart financial know-how, they were able to turn it into something where you'd be happy to spend $25 for a, a lobster roll. It was at this point I started to ask myself, who the hell is this show for? How many random Netflix viewers simultaneously have enough money and desire to buy and remodel entire motels? And if it's trying to get us to come all the way to Sobble Beach to stay at the June Motel, why are you telling us how little you paid for the room tchotchkes? We have that IKEA table! Just when things are kicked into high gear, painted all the walls in a translucent film, assembled all the malm dressers, and sold the beautiful, Hardwood walls for 30 pieces of silver. COVID hits. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. COVID-19 is a real thing. It certainly is, ladies, as it was for anyone who watched the show on Netflix. I'm sure they too were dealing with isolation, lost wages, inadequate government response, especially in small communities like Sobble Beach. But you wouldn't know it from watching these two. 
even with COVID, I feel like we've managed to pull off like a really amazing moment. It's pretty wild to be a member of the real world and see April and Sarah struggle with the problems that rich entrepreneurs face during the height of the Okay, wait, YouTube can be weird if you say certain words too many times, so instead of saying C-O-V-I-D, I'm gonna use some hip marketing know-how and call it the lobster roll. For example, there is this white fence surrounding the pool. White, you'd think? Surely they'd keep this as to save money and because it's already the not color they love so much. Well, I'm sorry to say you are a fool because obviously it should be ripped up and replaced with one of the easiest materials to clean glass. The plan seems all fine and dandy until they learn about the lumber and labor shortages. Everywhere there is a shortage of pressure treated yeah. lumber and it's a result of mills having been shut down. Rick does not have any more lumber to do any more than what I see right now. No. They also want to build a wood structure to eat under. Our first priority is getting some sort of shade structure built. Pergola! The name you're looking for is Pergola, you uncultured swine! And run into issues securing plexiglass, another material on hold because of the chaos caused by the once in a century global disaster. It's gonna be tricky to get it on time. It is a shortage, but that's kinda on me to find it. You can see the contractor is getting frustrated at April and Sarah's complete lack of understanding of why there might be severe delays. Then they stumble upon black mold and for some reason never check to see if the pool pump actually worked. So right before opening, they tack on an entire list of things that other workers will have to come in and risk their lives to do. But these are the sacrifices that the June Motel demands. Don't worry, by the end of the series, they painted everything white or clitoral puce and have it all ready for a motel packed with guests during the lobster roll. Because nothing can stop the flow of rosé. The writers of the HBO show Succession said that they didn't need to rewrite any of the new seasons to incorporate the lobster roll because wealthy people weren't affected by it. At least not in the way that you or I or the locals were affected by the tainted lobster roll. What a brilliant insight, also illustrated by Sarah and April's talks about their financial situation. The June in Savile Beach was supposed to be open by now, and our original motel has also been closed, so we've had no income at all. We don't know when money is going to start coming in, and we have such huge bills to pay. When they say that they are losing money, they're not losing money in the way that you or I think of losing money. Like being denied unemployment as you watch your savings shrink every time you buy ramen at the grocery store. They mean it as in a loss of future profits. They had wanted to open the motel on schedule, so the money they claim they lost is really just money they'll have to wait slightly longer for. Rich people count money that they haven't made yet, but wanted to make as money they have lost. Take a deep gulp of rosé and let that sink in. If you already have tons of money, this lobster roll was a breeze. More than that, in fact, the richest of the rich made bank during the pandemic, while working class families dealt with unsafe work environments and job loss. The rich live in a different reality, and it's really hard to understand what exactly we're supposed to feel bad about during any of this. This feels good. You know who I feel bad for? I feel bad for the locals. In June of 2020, a few months before this episode was shot, the city council closed Salba Beach because of tourists, after people witnessed the recklessness of beachgoers over the last two weekends. I feel bad for the contractors and the people who might be infected by the soon-to-come swaths of out-of-towners demanding lattes at every store that dared to brew a cup of joe. This is where the show was really boiled down to its essence. Six episodes of two rich people only mildly inconvenienced by a raging pandemic, narrating other people's labor while twirling their mustaches about how they can lower the water pressure to save on their monthly bill. They will occasionally paint like one board or check to see how paint looks on a door. I'm into it. But then they'll just walk away and let someone else finish the job. I have lots of stuff to do. Okay, thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Really? Couldn't have gone out of here any faster, could he have? But what really made this show emotionally hit home for me is that description of Sauble Beach, a small rural town on the Great Lakes whose economy relies on summer tourism. That's the exact description of my hometown. Well, technically I'm from the village to the south of 
St. Joseph, Michigan is a coastal beach town that swells with visitors every summer from Chicago, Illinois. Or, as locals lovingly call them, Phipps. Growing up, I used to work at this very Jimmy John's, and every summer there'd be a line out the door of people from Chicago waiting to call me a if I didn't put enough mayo in their tuna sandwiches. But by September, the town is back to its bare bones, like a tide of rich Chicagoans coming in and out and disrespecting our many local traditions, like cherry spitting and fudge gathering. Needless to say, our local economy is a feast and famine of Phipps, coming into town and peeing in Lake Michigan. On October 27th of this year, the Michigan House of Representatives passed House Bill 4722. Introduced by GOP Congress girl boss Sarah Leitner and backed by special interest groups, which would rip away the local government's power to limit the number of short-term rentals in their own districts. In other words, instead of local governments deciding what's best for local communities, rich out-of-town developers and politicians get to decide what's best for local communities. I wanted to reach out to Representative Sarah Leitner, but unfortunately it seems like she has already moved on to the noble effort of pretending that the election was a fraud and trying to stop ghosts from tampering with future ballots. I feel like she should have a little more respect for Michigan Girl State Speaker of the House 2010. You'd think this was another hot button issue that divides Michiganders as much as our separate peninsulas. But that's curiously not the case. According to a poll conducted by the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association, locals overwhelmingly oppose the bill. With a whopping 89% of voters against this bill in its current form. This is probably because the real benefactors of this bill are rich investors like Sarah and April, who have the capital to buy up properties, pay as little as they can to local contractors, and skip town with as big of a profit as they can get away with. 14 years ago, St. Joseph put a ban on short-term rentals in this historic area, as those short-term rentals turned most of these homes into hollow vaginal walls for half of the year and prevented new families from moving in, who would support the local economy year-round and not just during cherry spitting season. Watching this Netflix series was like watching a pink tsunami slowly swallow a town alive. And I grew up in the ripple effects of what happens when locals are priced out of their own town. Back in the day, St. Joseph was the cheap place to get a house. But as the locals were slowly priced out of the area, they started buying properties in the town next door, Benton Harbor, a historically black neighborhood, which today is being gentrified as those black families that have lived there for generations are now also being priced out of that area. And the cycle continues as the June motels of the world stay ever afloat. By the way, if you want to learn more about Benton Harbor's proposed Black Wall Street Zone, I've included some links in the description box below. Allowing rich out-of-town investors and large corporations to buy up swathes of land dries up the cost of living for everyone else. Rooms went from $90 to $500 a night. While sinking smaller family-owned businesses. These ladies, truly honorary fibs. When I was growing up, the locals had somewhat of an ironic parable that we lived by. The most expensive homes owned by the richest visitors and citizens were on the bluff overlooking the idyllic Silver Beach. But as every year passed, Lake Michigan would take more and more of the beach with it. The houses would end up falling into the bluff, and every year it encroached on the next row of what are now multi-million dollar homes. The things that made other people feel the richest were also the most precarious, the worst investment, and ultimately fell to the fates of wind, Water and time. I just think these gals are so neat. And I'm so proud of them for doing all of that by themselves. The biggest lesson I learned is to really stick to your own unique sense of style. And there's a lot of creative ways to increase profit margins that evolve plywood. Their story is so inspirational for these unprecedented times. And I'm sure widely applicable to an entire audience hoping to open up their own boutique motel empires. And remember, though money can buy happiness and coveted property on the Lake Michigan shore, that's not why these girls did it. I can't believe they're gonna be cast here tomorrow. It's why we did this all in the first place. It's kind of hard to like remember that sometimes. It, it really is. It's been a really hard year. Aww. Well, let's see what some of their customers have to say.
If you're here only to post on the gram, they have a lot of cool spots, but Instagram versus reality is a real thing here. The plastic roof on the pergola is not at an angle, so the water just pools in the grooves and falls through the cracks. Almost nothing in town is open because nobody is available for hire once students go back to school. Wait a minute, this place sounds terrible. Unified. That's such a good moment. No, no, no. <laughs> this is an iconic moment. That is a moment. Freedom. Anyways, this video was brought to you by Movie, a curated streaming service showing the best films from around the globe. Movie premieres a new film every day, so there's always something new. After trudging through the swamp of reality TV, I'll head over to Mubi and pick out one of their great documentaries for a little sincerity and humanity. Like Meeting the Man, James Baldwin in Paris, where Baldwin exposes the misconceptions and assumptions of the filmmakers through a series of combative and illuminating interviews. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival, the best of cinema, streaming anytime, anywhere. And you, dear viewer, can try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash MMFish. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash M-M-Fish for a whole month of great cinema for free. I'd like to thank you all for leaning into the moment of this YouTube video with me. 2021 sure was something. I hope I was able to bring you a little joy or something to think about or commiseration. Whatever you needed to get through your year. I want to give a big special thanks to all my patrons whose support helps me make these videos. If you're not a patron but you'd like to support and get videos before anyone else, you can head over to patreon.com slash Maggie Mayfish and sign up. In 2022, I'm going to be starting a patron-only Discord channel where we'll do movie watch parties and other fun stuff. You can also support me by liking the video, making sure you're subscribed, hitting the bell to get notifications, and comment below with your favorite shade of flesh. Mine's fallopian nude. I hope your new year is a good one. Or at least not worse. Save Martha.